Hello everybody. Let's go to this today's question and ask JP. Uh, the first question is from Anshu from Delhi. Anshu. Hello, sir. My name is Anshu. Hello. I'm from Delhi. I wanted to ask you a question regarding the role of women in the energy sector, specifically the transition from non-renewable energy to renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you, Anshu. It's a tough question. Uh, honestly, I've given a lot of thought to energy transition, but I don't think I really thought enough about the gender role in energy transition, except in a broader sense. Uh, about availability of energy, particularly in rural and poor areas, and therefore the impact on women in terms of day-to-day -day chores and their livelihoods and lives. Uh, but let's today make an initial effort to look at this, and hopefully uh, we will all explore this uh, very important issue a little deeper later on. First, when it comes to the poorer segments of the population, Lack of access to energy is one of the biggest causes of low quality of life, sickness, you know, in the olden days of grandmothers, when I was raised in a village, they used to use only firewood and therefore, you no, know, they used to have this tube and uh, I don't know how they survived. All kinds of health problems, uh, respiratory problems, they were very endemic. Many people died very prematurely and life was extremely painful, very difficult. Certainly, any form of energy, it doesn't have to be renewable energy, even the gas, etc., it has transformed the lives and it's becoming increasingly popular. And the governments, successive governments, have taken that seriously. But even now, if you go to interior, remote, and forest areas, uh, I don't think that your gas cylinders, etc., are reaching them. And therefore, the decentralized energy model of renewable energy, the solar power, luckily because it's now become cheaper and the storage also is now. Uh, sustainable. Uh, if we develop uh, tools of electric uh, power being used for cooking purposes, not merely uh, the fossil fuels, and I think technologies are available, but I don't know if they're really affordable and accessible to everybody in the country, but I think that's done, then certainly that will improve the quality of life of the rural and uh, remote areas, the poor, the women in particular, who have this drudgery of cooking with firewood, and with traditional fuels and therefore detrimental to the environment and to their own health. Uh, the second is the middle classes. A decentralized energy model gives them greater security. If every household goes in for uh, a rooftop um, uh, solar power uh, along with uh, a proper battery, if new equipment is used, no electrical equipment, gadgets rather than the traditional gas stoves are used, Certainly, life becomes better, less polluting, uh, and uh, there is greater control over the resources locally. The third one, transport solutions. Take motor transport. If a motor car is available or an electric vehicle is available, gearless and without pollution, ease of driving, I think for the girls and the women of our country uh, to be driving vehicles becomes much more easy. I myself enjoy, for instance, an electric car where the transmission is um, uh, automatic, you don't have to change gears, etc. Zero pollution, it's a joy to ride that. Uh, and therefore, the driving becomes more pleasurable. And in a country where even now, it's driving is mostly even now, it's a male dominated, uh, 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 shall I say, activity, uh, women can do it much better. But what should bother us is about the women's participation in the workforce. India is one of the few large countries, maybe the only large country in which the women's participation in the workforce actually is declining. We are now somewhere around 20% or so, I am told. It used to be 30 plus percent. Actually, there is a decline in the past few years. One possibility is, as prosperity goes up a little bit in the poorer sections, the women are no longer accepting menial occupations as servant maids, cooks, and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, our economy has not created enough jobs where some level of skill is required, even if it's a low level of skill. A more secure and dignified job is available. Uh, and in the absence of that, women are now getting out of the uh, workforce, whereas modernity demands that there is greater women's participation in the workforce. 
I think what we should do is along with energy transition and decentralized systems of generation and storage of energy, we must create a large number of local activities that do not require any centralized collective work where women can find decent employment in a non-polluting environment with uh, solar power and renewable power. Uh, but I don't think we have good enough thought in this country. That also requires structural changes in the country uh, in terms of labor loss and so on and so forth. If the unit is slightly bigger than a very small entity, the labor loss come into effect. So we have to look at them very seriously. But women's participation in the workforce and energy transition, we must figure out how to link them both. So there's a lot we can do, but in a larger sense, without referring to merely gender, one issue I thought I should bring to everybody's notice. This transition is inevitable. It's necessary. From a country like India's perspective, it's not merely environmental, it's also that we are among large economies, very big importers of energy. 85 to 90 percent of the fossil fuels, or at least the petroleum fuels, we import. This simply is not uh, a very good thing for us as a country. Uh, it is the largest foreign exchange um, uh, we are deploying for this purpose, about uh, ranging from 70 to 100 to 120 billion dollars, depending on the petrol price in the world or oil price in the world. Uh, therefore, we have to move towards uh, the new energy. There's no choice. And technology is helping us. The global climate, concerns about environmental uh, change, rapid climate change and so on and so forth, they're helping us. But there is an economic cost because we have a grid now. Let me give you a simple example. I have a five kilowatt uh, solar power uh, rooftop um, station at my home. For practically all my purposes, that energy is sufficient. And I have some small storage, probably two kilowatt hours or something, two, two and a half kilowatt hours. But the truth is, while on an average five and a half hours of power is generated, five and a half to six hours of power is generated, 24 hour cycle, I'm giving the average. Uh, sometimes uh, a little longer, but the actual generation in terms of kilowattage is less. And therefore, the average is five and a half to six hours in our household uh, uh, solar power stations. Now, for the rest of the 18 hours, I have to either depend on the stored power, and that's not enough most of the times. Therefore, I draw from the grid. Because of the net metering system, I draw from the grid. And whenever I have surplus power, that is the generation is more than my consumption, it is banked in the grid. I don't lose anything. There are two things that are happening. The energy grid is compelled to maintain energy production and transmission to meet my needs to, to face the diurnal variation because production is not 24 hours, continuous. So the capital cost, the running cost is maintained for our needs without getting any tariff from me. And the second is, typically, the people who have the solar power stations at home, or rooftop solar power stations, they are at the relatively high income bracket. Therefore, their consumption would be higher, and the tariffs would be higher. They would be paying good tariff if they're drawing from the grid. And the system is losing those customers. The high end, high paying customers are lost to the system. So you are forced to bear the burden of the base load station to meet their 24 hour needs and you don't get the benefit of higher revenue from these consumers. But somebody has to fund them. Whether it's private sector or public sector, most of them are public sector, even in the private sector, somebody invested in the power plants, in the transmission lines, in the distribution system and they are maintaining it even when there is not enough revenue and that somebody has to be the state. And it's not an Indian problem, it's a global problem. Already our power utilities are in a crisis. Some years ago, they used to lose every year about 100,000 crores, all the state power boards together. Today, it varies from year to year. After so many packages and programs to help them, still they are in crisis. They are losing about 40, 50, 60, 70,000 crores a year. One state board of Tamil Nadu alone is losing annually about 17 to 20,000 crores. This is the current situation because of bad management for a variety of reasons. But what I'm mentioning is an inevitable cost you have to bear in addition to the current inefficiency in the system. And unless we brace ourselves for that transition and figure out a way of spending money, all our hopes and dreams of transitioning into a renewable energy uh, will not really bear fruit. 
but it's inevitable. We have to do that and therefore we have to find the money. And when we look at public finances, that's another issue which we're not taking into consideration right now. My backward envelope calculation is for the next 25 to 30 years or maybe 40 years, we will have to, on an average, account for about 2 lakh crores per year only for this transition, on an average. This amount may go up substantially later, it may be a little less now. But my estimate, back of the calculation is 2 lakh crores per year across the country. So transition is vital, it's inevitable, but we have to plan for that carefully and make available the resources, not merely the technology.